Professor Christopher Smith. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to start by um, saying that, that a lot of what I say will chime very much with our, our previous presentation. Um, I also want to say at the outset that I think that, that that comment about balance of subject provision is extremely important. Um, and I'll revert to that as we go on. But I wanted uh, in this presentation to respond quite directly for a bit at any rate to the, the um, enhancement theme that has been going on in Scotland about 21st century graduates. I mean, let's start with a headline, the BBC headline story. This is just taken a straight download from the BBC. Uh, underneath, uh, the reporter wrote, uh, comparing the two individuals, it's the end of your shift, you dash for the train, you switch on your mobile phone as you find yourself a seat. You log into your degree course learning zone and discover you've been set a tough assignment. You download some key textbooks from the online university library and begin swatting. While fellow commuters bury their heads in the metro, you get some tips from course mates through an online forum. By the time you reach your stop, you've tapped out an essay plan on your smartphone. <laughs> Now, now, some of that is already true um, for some students, and uh, some of it will be true for students. It's also very likely, it seems to me, that a lot of that will not be particularly true of, of other uh, students. But it's, it does raise some concerns, which I think in some ways are sharpened when we think about consequences of brand for the capacity of students to live away, to move away, to be mobile, uh, about the way that students will learn, um, which offers some particular challenges to what we think about graduate attributes, particularly in the way that they've been framed, because we're still thinking, in a sense, about how we persuade employers that what we do adds value. Here, for instance, uh, is an example from your own website, uh, taken from Australia, uh, trying to claim, effectively claiming, uh, a great deal for the ways in which a curriculum uh, process can enhance the value of an individual in their employment. And here's one from slightly closer to home. Now, I'm going to express some concerns about this direction of travel, but I don't want to detract from the fact that I think that most of the thinking and working that's gone in here has been absolutely excellent. It's uh, laudable, and I think a lot of it is in place already. But we can talk a little around the edges, I think, of this, because to a degree what we're doing here is answering to someone else's agenda, uh, and we need to be as critical of that agenda as we were self-critical in realising that we had some distance to travel as universities. It's quite values driven and I think we need to think about where those values are coming from. Uh, we do need to think about whether those values do work in the smartphone distance learning part-time commuter student world which may become more of a reality. And you'll see that since I am fortunate enough to live currently in another country, and not the one south of the border, um, I'd like to set this into a rather broader context of an international student world, and to ask if we're doing enough to ensure that this particular graduate, in, graduate attributes agenda is not too parochial on what the current situation does to that situation. <coughs> And I am going to say something about the value of arts, humanities and social sciences in this uh, debate. Um, there are some real challenges ahead. I uh, share the concerns which have been raised. I'm glad to see that there's some protection for modern languages. Um, I'm not sure that what's happened uh, signals the end of Western civilization as we know it, but I do think it's very important that we emphasise the issue about the contribution that arts and humanities have to play. So I too want to start with some of the obvious stuff uh, when we think about graduate attributes. Um, we know education pays off, we know it pays off for individuals and we know it pays off for society. Uh, some of the figures, um, OECD studies show that money spent on Obtaining university qualifications pays dividends higher than real interest rates. 
difference to the amount of money someone with tertiary education, i.e. college level or higher, can expect to earn compared to someone with only secondary education, uh, grew on average by one percentage point per year between 1997 and 2003 in 18 of 22 countries uh, on which OECD had the data. And the earnings differential ranges from between 25% to as much as 120%. So, although there are concerns, I think, about the, that graduate <coughs> premium, Every time one looks at the figures, they say something very particular about the value that education adds. So what does the government have to say about graduate attributes and graduate skills? What is it that makes education pay off? To some extent, there's a tacit or sometimes an explicit understanding that with education comes skills, that those skills are adapted to varying degrees to higher levels of work, therefore higher productivity and higher remuneration. So both individuals and society benefit. And we've been prepared for this by quite a number of statements over the year. So here's one from an unimaginably distant new labour past of targets and optimism. This is the Leach Report 2006. Um, Leach told us that skills make you happier. We didn't have enough skills in the UK, according to Leach. We still didn't in 2006, though it was better. And we needed more of them at every level, and that the only real test of skills was qualifications, so long as those qualifications, quote, reflect economically valuable skills. That was what Leach told us. We need more skills, they'll make us all happier, and our qualifications should be able to test them. And the Leach report led on uh, to the UK Commission for Employment and Skills, and these kinds of ambitions, again, that's why optimistic new labour targets and so forth. Um, for the UK to become world class in skills, uh, the aspiration, we need to commit to achieving things like 95% of adults with functional literacy and numeracy, uh, more than 90% of the adult population qualified to at least level 2, uh, levels 4 are higher education and 5 postgraduate education. You can see that the bottom line, world class high skills, whatever that means, well what it means is a number a number of the adult population qualified to level four and above. And here are uh, some of the numbers uh, about what the gap was seen to be. Um, level four and above needing to move very substantially. Uh, all of these um, figures were needing to shift. Now, underlying this, there's a driver. What's the driver? Much of this is driven by concern about productivity in the UK and Europe more generally. And here are the UK CES uh, figures, and you can see um, us uh, lurking away happily in the right quartile. But the clear call was to drive this on through more skills, better attuned graduate attributes, which would lead to improved productivity. And from that we got quite a lot of language about high performance working, um, giving you better engagement in the workplace and much stronger input to and benefit from work. So here are a number of, of the quotes which UK CES uh, brought out to demonstrate that high performance working, that's working that was driven by these graduate attributes and skills, uh, would improve life makers happier. UK CES have all sorts of definitions of human capital drivers and stacks of fully recognisable words for us like communication, inclusiveness, development, training, innovation. 
If you took much of what we did, have done, are doing as a sector in relation to graduate attributes, if you look as I have done, if you read as I have done everything on the graduate attributes website, you'll find all these words mirrored across very effectively. We try to foster and then to capture the things which students have done which can demonstrate that they're capable of showing these skills, of learning in the workplace and of driving all these individual and societal benefits. And here are some key texts. Back to the OECD and the strong justification for higher education. You get more for higher qualifications. If you spend money, there's a return, societally as well, socially as well as individually. But there are some worrying signs that are coming in, which Mike also referred to. Back in 2006 to 8, the graduate premium was already weakening. What does the graduate premium look like post-Brown? Years ago, uh, Alison Wolfe, in a very influential book called Does Education Matter, argued that in some instances it was entirely possible to leave school and stay ahead of some lower paid graduates because of the longer time you had spent in the workplace, in the job market. We all know now very clearly that for all the rhetoric about how good it is to go to university, a lot of our graduates don't get graduate level employment or don't get it very quickly. And it turns out, according to this same rhetoric that we have in a sense been responding to, that we weren't so good after all at training. Who knows better about this than employers? The CBI, Future Fit. Um, an important report in 2009, we're creeping closer to the new world here, a report that was fully cognizant of the economic crisis, published a report on preparing graduates for the world of work. What did employers say? Well, it turns out we had actually cracked a lot of the issues already. 80% satisfied or very satisfied that uh, graduates had a majority of the skills. Terrific. Unfortunately, it also turns out that as a sector, we're pretty bad at turning out literate or numerate people. Oops. <laughs> um, I think that here... When we start looking at these kinds of comments, we have to ask about whether this isn't a problem that's a great deal more deep-seated. I remember um, years ago attending a meeting when the SCQF was being discussed for higher education. We sat in a room and earnestly discussed what the SCQF for higher education could, should look like. And when we asked, well, what happens the level below the level that we get them at, the answer was, well, we haven't got around to thinking about that yet. We were trying to articulate with something that hadn't been touched, which meant that the holistic approach to a curriculum bottom-up had not been delivered. I think there's still a lot of work to be done on core basic skills here. More of what the CBI wants. Um, all reasonably straightforward stuff. Uh, and look at the second bullet point, STEM. Um, prove the environment for university business collaboration, research and innovation. A few places better than Strathclyde to demonstrate that. And here we go. So that sells told. We should improve students' employability skills. And that's a university job. And more of it. Business relevant degrees in STEM are vital to the UK's future growth. It's not difficult to see why Brown got to where he got to, when this is the persistent rhetoric through all the reports that uh, had been leading up to his situation. I'd like to just pose a few questions about this and just ask you whether we all think that this is actually going to stack up. Let's take three statements which follow from this line of argument. First, we need more skills, more skills, more skills to, pro to drive up productivity. We need these skills specifically in STEM. 
And I want to be very clear here that the argument, it seems to me, that has run through this kind of rhetoric is the skills you get from STEM subjects are more valuable than skills you acquire from other subjects. That's by no means a university view, but I think it's in the view of some of the documents that came out that led to where we are. And thirdly, universities are the place to inculcate these economically vital skills. It's our job to do. Is that all absolutely right? So, let's think a little bit about some measures of productivity. Um, Mike said that universities have been actually doing rather a good job. Here's a measure of productivity. According to Biz, a university sector has substantially increased almost all measures of productivity in research-related income. Every part of this graph, the, the, the uh, top one is now, and you see the, the trajectory is almost all upwards. And we also get more bang for our buck. The same information pr uh, produces the result that we file fewer patents than the Americans do, but we get more money from them, more return on each one. And yet, as we know, investment remains low. It remains below the European Union Commission recommendation. And whilst one might ask whether their, their recommendation has weight, it stands. Uh, and I think that there is perhaps some interesting issues as one looks at the way that European uh, statistics stack up about the strength of the research base. Here you can see the United Kingdom lagging below with researchers per thousand workforce. International graduates in advanced research programs represent more than 40% of the graduate output in the UK. But other figures show here how low we are as a proportion per thousand workforce. And investment in R&D trails other European countries, such as Germany, a uh, comment that has just been made. Here we go, OECD figures, look well, where we are in R&D. And some of the biggest failures are actually in business. It's not, um, excuse me, it's not in other words just about us. A point that we've just had made by the principal. And I think we need to address this issue quite straight on. The CBI report that I mentioned, Fit for Work, has case studies from six universities and six employers about ways in which collaboration could work together. I counted up that there are about 100,000 undergraduate students in the universities and about 500 work placements, of which 150 were in accountancy, and several of the rest were going to be axed as soon as the financial market got tough. So that's actually quite a big problem uh, for us as we think about how uh, business is engaging with delivering some of the skills which we know they want, and which they are perhaps better placed to deliver. And this isn't going to get much better. Uh, we, um, we sh we're all so relieved at the moment that we've not been decapitated that um, it seems like a small amputation is really quite okay. <laughs> Who needs a leg? We've still got our head. Um, here's Universities UK on investment elsewhere in education. This is from a, a document which is marvellously entitled Racing to the Top or Limping to Mediocrity. Um, <laughs> It seems to me uh, that there are some issues here about exactly how we make these statistics, these equations stack up for the assumptions that we need more skills, that we need skills in very specific areas, and that those uh, specific areas of science, and we need to drive them through universities. We are or were in the right quartile for productivity. Um, Germany has better vocational education than we do, long been the case. 
My ill-educated guess is that quite a lot of what differenti differentiates us from Switzerland has to do with things other than our failure to concentrate on STEM subjects. And perhaps that's just an idealisation of the Swiss. Um, it seems to me that working from this to intervene in the subject mix is a somewhat under-motivated act. Interestingly, PricewaterhouseCooper in 2005 claimed that returns on investment were highest for law, management, social sciences and European languages. They were lowest for biology, medicine, history and psychology. Dear, dear. Um, and remember what employers said, our largest failings in non-business related skills are in literacy and numeracy. It's very true, I think, that uh, arts and humanities and social sciences have allowed themselves to be um, too much about self-expression and finding oneself and so on. Um, I well, attended an occasion which was supposed to showcase the best uh, of all the disciplines, physical science, life science, social science and arts and humanities. Uh, the scientists all claimed really major advances in uh, life of batteries, in um, uh, biodiversity, in understanding major social issues in he ahead of us. The arts professor claimed to be helping students to find out through creative writing if they were more like Jane Austen or Emily Bronte. <laughs> oh dear. Arts and humanities can be about this, um, just as science can be ignoble, but it's not very interesting. And it seems to me we're about far more. Most creative arts education, such as in outstanding institutions like uh, RSAMD and Glasgow School of Art, where I spent this morning, add intellectual sharpness, purpose, pursuit of excellence, which are second to none. Arts education may lead to self-discovery, but it's also about finding things out, solving problems and communicating results. Historians, uh, archaeologists, and so on and so forth are in a, uh, the same league of discovery and communication as science. We share more than differentiates us. Why are we so convinced that the CBI is right, that the university is the right place for all of this skills training? I think we have to look at education more holistically as a society. That means putting some things back, it seems to me, to schools and pushing some things out to employers or better, engaging with employers to bring those things together as a partnership. One of the challenges, it seems to me, which face us nationally is that as student enrolments, enrolments fall, which I think must be inevitable after Brown, it's business that's going to have to pick up the challenge of skilling the workforce. And perhaps they should be coming to us for some clues. For it's not just arts, humanities and social sciences that gets criticised in this rather uh, lacklustre debate. After all, Sainsbury's complained that when they got scientists they didn't know enough about food science. We can all be driven into places where we don't want to be by this agenda. Our job ought to be about fostering the spirit of learning. And that takes us back to our smartphone students' experience. Compensating for the absence of some of the traditional spaces uh, in which these skills are learnt is complex. Could it be that the compensation should be the quality of the learning that is taking place? The quality of the learning and the content. So what should high quality teaching and learning look like? Here's a defence of my end of things, arts and humanities, social sciences, both from AHRC and the British Academy. I think in truth much of what's said here uh, could, with slight changes, apply across the sector. But to begin with, the defence which uh, AHRC and British Academy offered uh, was a numbers game uh, more students, more overseas students. Uh, interesting one in the middle, developed economies, almost 90% of value-added growth comes from services, only 10% from goods-producing industries. Employers, as the CBI did, identify critically important soft skills. Skills that can be uh, acquired by anybody, but which are part of 
some aspects of the stock and trade. Um, analysis, providing ideas, providing inspiration, uh, anticipation, better, effect, better and more effective and more innovative communication. But it can be very hard to sell arts, humanities and social sciences. Like science, we wind up sometimes in some pretty esoteric places. This is one of the British Academy's uh, key uh, examples of what really marked us out as being excellent. And I think that it's pretty easy both to defend this, but also rapidly to see how you quickly you get to the so what question. Um, and having the difference between launch and chuck and bung and wang and heave uh, is gets us into whether you can persuade Jim Nockerty to give you any airspace or Melvin Brown to pick you up. And it doesn't actually help the cause when the AHRC produces a snappy slogan like, I quote, Arts and Humanities research is a driver of the culture ecosystem. <laughs> We can point, as here, to the importance of creativity, of an understanding of social behaviour, and of the flair to carry good ideas forward. And it seems to me that those kind of, of attributes go right across the sector, but include some of those degrees which are currently getting quite a hammering. Media studies, as if it didn't matter that we should understand the media that dominate our lives and dominate the way that people sell their products. Art and, and art education, a generator of ideas and imaginative flair for decades. We've got to resist the, the blog response which says that the only graduate attributes come from particular kinds of degrees. This shouldn't be an either-or situation. And if we get the language right over these really critical next few years, where we should be setting the pace, perhaps we can reassert the relevance of strong subject-specific subject -specific learning as ultimately the best developer of graduate skills and attributes. Quickly to look at another uh, area and worry about productivity in graduate skills. We think about productivity, as has been mentioned, we are, as a sector, extraordinarily significant in contributing uh, to the, the national common wealth. The UK remains extraordinarily competitive. Um, international activities bring in, according to the Universities UK, around £5 billion a year. It's a very major contribution. But there are still some challenging issues about what happens to these highly skilled workforce and at the higher ends we uh, have a static or worse UK population masked by an incoming uh, overseas population. We score very highly in measures of the numbers of overseas students recruited um, and we've not seen anything like the tailing off that the US saw as a result of their visa uh, debacle. We must guard against that happening. And this area is going to surely become far more significant. This map, if you look at the, uh, the big rises in forecasts of global demand for international higher education, they're in sub-Saharan Africa and East Asia. Look at the huge demand those countries can generate for teachers within their own countries. How can we respond and indeed how will they manage that demand? We have a huge role to play, it seems to me. Maybe subject uh, is not a strong driver of international recruitment, but it's arguable that diversity is. It's a very spread uh, pattern, this, of full-time postgraduate students uh, coming through. In almost all subjects, we're seeing international students, and therefore diminishing the spread and scope of our portfolio may turn out to be foolish. So let's start with our own back door. How good are we at engaging with Europe? The question seems to be relevant in two ways. Are we sure that we're making the decisions which allow us to sustain a critical part of the profitability of the UK higher education sector? 
And second, are we sure our graduate attributes are allowing us fully to engage in this world? Now, the number of UK institutions which get the European Univer Union approved diploma supplement label is probably a weak indicator of our engagement, but it may become a more important one as we see Europe emphasising more and more the importance of mobility of students through the Union. Uh, uh, youth on the move is the European Union strap line for where higher education is going to go. We know that student mobility from the UK into Europe is and remains poor. Uh, the UK is the 11th leading place of origin for students going to the US, um, but it's the, the UK is the number one destination coming the other way around. So America's fine, but look at Europe, um, fewer students sent abroad, non-UK EU students 11% of outgoing. So the second bullet is the people from the UK who go abroad from the UK aren't UK-based domiciled students. Um, other indications from the Europe Unit and the British Council. Why? Um, some of the answers are perhaps fairly obvious. Students see the ability or the lack of ability to speak a foreign language as a powerful barrier to studying abroad. The fall in UK Erasmus student mobility is closely paralleled by the decline in students <coughs> studying European languages. Interestingly, um, well, obviously, the languages uh, that local immigrant origin uh, students speak here, Asian languages, Arabic and so forth, do not correspond to Erasmus countries, country languages in, large, in Europe. Um, and the evidence suggests that they're also unlikely to visit uh, universities in India and Bangladesh because their parents think it's a downward step. There are huge issues, therefore, for those countries as they improve their internal uh, uh, recruitment. Now, it's good to see modern languages back on the educational agenda, especially at school level, as long as we take a broad view of what that means. Potentially, equipping students with the capacity to engage with an international market should be one of our strongest suits, but it's one where a track record is weak. So, coming to some conclusions. Currently, we're so mired in what seems like a desperate fight for survival that we've failed, perhaps, to capitalise on the growth of the past decade. We still see ourselves as agents of other larger concerns, not autonomous institutions of huge local, local and sometimes global significance. And that's very much a part of the issue of the extent to which governments should be allowed to regard us as their regard us as their servants. We're undoubtedly right to think of the 21st century graduate, but they're not graduating for UK PLC or for the CBI. They're graduating for themselves, and that's increasingly important as they bear more of the share of that cost. And that's going to be very particularly true for arts and humanities and social sciences. Geoffrey Crossick. I think these words are exactly right. Universities are educating students for jobs that haven't yet been invented. Skill seems too narrow a word for what is being described here, but I'm content to use it so long as we understand the term to embrace the knowledge, imagination and analytical ability to adapt and to learn new things over and over again in the years to come. And we need to be conscious, of course, of the current economic climate and the needs of employers, but that means all employers, including schools, universities, cultural institutes, arts councils, art galleries, museums, libraries, sports uh, providers and so forth. That world which nourishes and protects our communal civic life. We cannot know what that means precisely, and arguing somehow that we must match our curricula to specific sectors now is less productive than an acknowledgement that whatever happens, our capacity to imagine, to think and to be creative will always be required in a modern participatory workforce. Regardless of the mode of study, all UK graduates are going to have to face an extraordinarily difficult set of challenges. 
The temporary economic situation seems to me potentially not to be the most pressing. We're in the midst of it, but it will pass. Massive demographic shifts of an ageing Europe and an ageing China for that matter. By 2050, a third of China's citizens will be over 60. Three, uh, that's three times the current proportion. Immigration. Across Europe this is causing problems. Europeans don't like it very much. And the rise of right-wing politics, which still requires uh, more and more analysis, is presently, apparently, quite unstoppable. Between now and 2050, Europe will lose 66 million workers, demographically. Where are they going to come from? How are we going to be productive? There will be about two retirees for every one active person. Climate change, resource-based conflict, all of these issues. What are the greatest challenges facing us? The Brown Report? We th I think that there are really substantial issues about the recognition of our core and retention and negotiation of core cultural values in this very, very difficult market. Now, and difficult future. Do we have core cultural values? Um, this, you will be astonished to discover, is uh, actually from Erasmus Mundus itself. It's their 2008 cultural preparation course for North African students coming to Europe. I kid you not. <laughs> Talkative as a fin. Um, oh, well, I won't go any further. <laughs> uh, what are European values? We could make our languages at universities reflect more consciously and more ambitiously an agenda which goes beyond the self-regarding aspirations of students as potential wage earners or generators of wealth. If we relate attributes to values, we surely come back to critical academic values, broad knowledge and understanding good argument arising from that evidence, and the capacity for empathy and respect for cultural diversity, whilst being able to justify and defend a broad range of duties and obligations. If the greatest threat to our European way of life comes from intolerance, ignorance, and an incapacity for self-reflection and empathy, then the role of a historically rooted and fundamentally internationalised education system becomes indispensable. And internationalised doesn't just mean Europe. Since even the stoutest defender of a sense of Europe must acknowledge that Europe now exists only effectively in a global and to a varying degrees globalised world. And of course this isn't new and of course it isn't original. And one of our problems and our difficulties, as with that AHRC uh, uh, example, is that um, we don't have good new arguments, we have the very, very good old arguments that just need to be restated again and again, firmly and with evidence. In 1997, Martha Nussbaum wrote a marvellous account of the values of humane liberal education in the USA. She claimed a good deal for the value of this education uh, over single subject European focus. Uh, she was very strong on the fact that the Americans uh, were much better and much liberal, and much more liberal than we were because they had a broad education. Four years later, George Bush was elected president. <laughs> now, the argument stands, I think, that Martha Nussbaum made that the critical capacity to examine oneself and one's traditions, to see oneself as part of a much wider community, and to be able to imagine oneself in different social, economic, religious and gendered places are essential to citizenship. And I do think arts, humanities and social science has something very special to say here, even though I would absolutely argue that so does science, and I would absolutely defend against her claim that this is specific to reading novels and literature, that this can be achieved through a whole range of engagements, including with social science methodology and good history and so forth. But it is true that in our teaching and in our research, arts, humanities and social science consistently and rigorously develop ideas which challenge, inspire and develop thinking across the world. And it seems to me the 21st graduate in her classroom, or on his train, in his cafe, or in her student union, deserves the ability and the opportunity to engage with those great and exciting ideas.
The strand of work that's been conducted uh, through graduate int- attributes has revealed the immensely dedicated and committed and intelligent work which professional university staff by no means all academics, many of them not academics, have made uh, to ensure that the environment exists and to capture its effects. It stands, I think, as a reminder of the inseparable value of strong student services and rigorous, challenging and rich intellectual content. Great sadness of these past days is the thought that the richness, that richness will now be available to fewer to a less diverse population in age and social background, and that the space and time for students to study and to interact creatively with their world and this academic content will be squeezed by unprecedented financial constraints. I'll conclude with some words of Seneca, uh, first century AD philosopher. He wrote, while we live, while we are among human beings, let us cultivate our humanity. Thank you.